Thank you for coming to our panel discussion on radical <laughs> ideology today, Marxism and anarchism, hosted by Platypus. Uh, I'm going to say a very little about Platypus, a little bit about our panel, and then a little bit about our speakers, and then hand it over to our speakers. So, the Platypus Affiliated Society, established in December 2006, organizes reading groups, public fora, research, and journalism focused on problems and tasks inherited from the old 1920s, 30s, new 1960s, 70s, and post-political 80s, 90s left for the possibilities of emancipatory politics today. Um, we're doing a reading group right now in Stony Brook, and um, speak to Soren or me if you'd like to come to those. Um, we also do coffee breaks occasionally, but, our, but the main focus of our activity is putting up events like these. Um, we also have the Platypus Review, which is um, open submission and is kind of our forum in print, where we print uh, such conversations. Uh, a little bit about the panel. It seems that there are still only two radical ideologies, Marxism and anarchism. They emerged out of the same crucible, the Industrial Revolution, the unsuccessful revolutions of 1848 and 1871, a weak liberalism, the centralization of state power, the rise of the workers' movement, and the promise of socialism. They are the revolutionary heritage and all significant radical upsurges of the past 150 years have returned to mind their meaning for the current situation. In this respect, our moment seems no different. There are a few ways these ideologies have been taken up. Occupy reflects one pattern. A version of Marxist theory is used to comprehend the world, while an anarchist practice is used to organize in order to change it. Some on the left resist this combination, calling for a strategic reorganization of the working class to resist austerity, and perhaps push forward something like a new New Deal. This view remains wedded to a supposedly practical welfareist social democracy, which strengthens the state and manages capital. Finally, there have been attempts to leave the grounds of these theories entirely, but these often seem to either land right back in one of the camps or to remain marginal. The historical experience concentrated in these ideas must be unfurled if they are to serve as compass points. To act today, we seek to see in what ways the return of these ideologies represent an authentic engagement and in what ways the return of a ghost. Where have the battles left us and what forms do we have for meeting, theoretically and practically, the problems of our present? We also gave our panelists a set of questions, and I'll read just a few of them. One, what do Marxism and anarchism have to say to those politicized today? Do they instruct us on how we might act now? Must we return to these orientations, and if so, how? Two, what forms of organization are necessitated by the theories we inherit and the tasks of today? Three, what are the most important splits and breaks between and within both traditions, both Marxism and anarchism? And four, what are the inalienable values and the end goals of radical politics? Are Marxism and anarchism ideologies of freedom, of democracy, of the working class? How do they handle the objective contradictions of realizing these principles under the conditions of capitalist life. Um, I'll say a little bit about each of our speakers. The order in which they're going to present is Richard will be presenting first, then Michael, then Joshua, and then Adam. So I'll, I'll, I'll introduce them in that order. Richard Greenman has been active since 1957 in civil rights anti-war, anti-nuclear, environmental, and labor struggles in the US, Latin America, France, where he has been a long-time resident, and Russia, 
where he helped found the Praxis Research and Education Center in 1997. Like Victor Serge, the Franco-Prussian revolutionary novelist to whom Richard has devoted many translations and biographical studies, Richard places Marxism and anarchism in the larger context of socialism and inter internationalism and sees them as complementary. Michael Schwartz is an American sociologist and prominent critic of the Iraq War. He is distinguished teaching professor of sociology at Stony Brook University, where he also serves as director of the Undergraduate College of Global Studies and chair of the sociology department. Schwartz has written extensively in the areas of economic sociology and social movements. Schwartz received his doctorate from the Department of Social Relations at Harvard University, where he was a student of Harrison White and Charles Tilley. His writings on Iraq have appeared in Tom Dispatch, Asia Times, Mother Jones, and Contacts. In Radical Protest and Social Structure, one of his books, Schwartz develops the, con the concept of structural ignorance to refer to how individuals make choices and decisions with regard to collective action based on their position in the social structure, which constrains their access to relevant information. Next, we have Joshua Stephens. Joshua is a board member with the Institute for Anarchist Studies, a contributing editor at the War Resisters League magazine, WIN, and has been active in anti-capitalist and international solidarity movements for the past two decades. He teaches and lectures internationally on anarchist themes, and his writing has appeared at Truthout, Alternet, Waging Nonviolence, and Jadalia. Jadalia. Adam Israel is a doctoral student in philosophy at Stony Brook University. His research focus is on radical political philosophy particularly the problems of temporal experience, the global legacy of colonialism, and state theory. His background includes several years in union organizing, student organizing, and popular education. Each panelist will get about 10 to 12 minutes to talk, and um, four, two to four minutes to respond to each other, and then audience Q&A. <coughs> so we'll begin with Richard. Well, thank you, Devia, for <laughs> saying exactly what I would have said in the first uh, three minutes, but most eloquently, uh, about uh, Marxism and anarchism uh, being the two principal schools of thought that arose out of the worldwide international revolutionary movements of the 19th century and have continued in various forms and in various countries uh, through the 20th century, uh, eclipsed for a while, but now with a new generation and a globalized society uh, suddenly relevant again. Uh, I have a little button that shows Karl Marx's picture and it says, uh, I told you this would happen. Uh, uh, <coughs> the, uh, I have always cons been tempted by the ideas of the anarchists uh, Kropotkin, in particular, anarcho-communism, and uh, by the subculture to a great extent. I had my little red wobbly card, and I could sing all the folk songs uh, when I was a student in the 50s. Uh, uh, but at the same time, I was attracted by the, the historical sweep and theoretical rigor of uh, Marxism. Uh, and, but I came to age politically in the wake of the 1956 Hungarian Revolution against totalitarian state capitalist communism, Stalinism, as it was practiced in uh, the former Russian Empire, and as it is uh, being practiced right now uh, with some mafia additives uh, by Mr. Putin. Not that that in any way justifies the attempts of U.S. imperialism and NATO to turn uh, uh, the poor uh, Ukrainians into debt serfs uh, to the IMF and end up like Romania and Bulgaria uh, as uh, sucking hind tit in the EU. 
By the way, just latest bulletin. You, you know that the economy is a basket case in Ukraine? No, it's a very rich country. They're in debt to whom? Russia. All the money that these oligarchs squandered and the crooked politicians that they borrowed, they owe to Russia. And now the United States is supposed to give them a billion dollars to, uh, because paying your debts, that's the most important thing. That is the class line that unites, finally, all of these imperialists that want to bite off a chunk of uh, Ukraine. And, of course, Ukraine is the place where anarchists uh, uh, were the most uh, uh, decisive in the Russian Civil War military and self-organized force. I'm talking about the movement of Nestor, led by Nestor Makhno and uh, advised by uh, uh, Volin, Boris Achenbaum, and uh, they fought the whites and uh, were betrayed by the reds. Uh, Lenin and the others made a compact with them uh, where they would be able to retain their autonomy and uh, right after they succeeded in breaking the back of the Kolchek, the White Guard army, uh, the Reds uh, turned on them and massacred them and uh, Machno ended up uh, selling tickets in a Marseille movie theater. Uh, but, uh, so the problem is that there has been a history of enmity between Marxism, at least in some of its uh, uh, manifestations or ramifications, and anarchism. And uh, these have historical roots going back all the way to the first international. Now, what I, my point of view is this. I think that anarchism is an invaluable corrective to the tendency among Marxists uh, to overstress organization, to overstress state power, uh, to uh, construct uh, uh, vanguard parties. As a Marxist, because that's half of my soul, I don't consider that real Marxist. Uh, I think that you could make a very good case that Marx, starting with the 1844 manuscripts, uh, was a humanist, and that Marx, after 1871, the Paris Commune, <coughs> moved much closer, in fact, to the anarchist idea of doing away with the state, and, uh, and that the working class would create out of itself a self-organized new society. So, uh, to me, coming to life politically, when the Soviets of my youth were the Soviets that were organized against Stalinist communism, which used Marxism as its propaganda, as its facade. And stimulated, by the way, the workers' Soviets in Budapest uh, were stimulated also by the ideas of Marxist humanism, because Marx's early works were being debated in party circles, and that's why they one of the uh, ideological uh, stepping stones that enabled them to move away from Stalinist communism and to see that Marxism is a basically a theory of liberation. Now, both Marxism and anarchism have as their goals the abolition of the state and its replacement by self-organized people. Uh, uh, basically, a, you could call it a utopian vision. Uh, the, the basic differences came on uh, historically in two uh, phases. One is on the need for a transitional state, because clearly if you smash the old state by revolutionary means, there's got to be some kind of organization and some organization of self-defense. <coughs> so this is a, a, a problem for anarchists, but not an insoluble one, because, for example, in Spain, when the fascists, or Spanish, as they're properly called, rose up in 1936, the anarchists and anarcho-syndicalists took over, where they had strong implementation in the unions, the transit, and the, uh, all different kinds of industries, where the post office, the telegraph, the telegraph, were taken over and run by the workers themselves. And on the land, the peasants, shot up the priests and the landowners, 
and uh, didn't hand out the, fa the farms, but decided that the village would cultivate them collectively. And to me, these are genuine um, additions, genuine new things brought to the history of people's self-liberation. And it was done under the aegis of anarchism. Now, the problem is this. The leadership of the anarchist and anarcho-syndicalist movements in Spain during the Civil War signed a devil's pact with the Stalinists and the bourgeoisie to form a popular front. They participated in the central government. And this central government, in order to win the war, the Stalinist slogan, you know, we win the war first and then afterwards we have the revolution. Yeah, you wait for it, buddy. <laughs> that Spanish Republican government, how many minutes? I can't see that. Five. Five, that's perfect. Uh, disbanded the collective farms, kicked out the collectives, gave back the land that had been seized. <coughs> now, the anarchists also organized the Drudy Column and many other famous military units, self-organized. And they were the ones that got to the front first long before the Stalinists with their Moscow gold. Actually, they stole the gold from, Moscow stole the gold from the Spanish Republic. But they used their um, willingness to ship arms to the Republic to get themselves uh, into the security apparatus and uh, shoot in the back the, uh, the liberation Marxists of the Pum and the anarchists who were their allies. And they, pro they provoked an uprising in, in Barcelona in April, May 1937, and took back all of the public utilities and everything that the workers had collectivized. Now the Pum too, as everyone knows from having read George Orwell, also had a militia at the front. <coughs> so there are anarchist solutions to the problem of the need to self-defend, uh, the problem of organizing the economy. Done. But what is the anarchist solution to anarchist leaders being sucked into a popular front, joining a bourgeois government run behind the scenes by Stalin's agents, and selling out the workers who had collectivized and the peasants who had collectivized? So you see, it, there are, the critiques of the one are necessary correctors for the critiques of the other. And that uh, I think that it's silly to call ourselves Marxists and anarchists and such. If pushed to the wall like Marx, I would call myself an internationalist or a revolutionary internationalist. I don't think you need to go any farther than that. But we could also call ourselves libertarian socialists to distinguish ourselves from state socialists. And I am one of the founders of an organization which is right now fighting for its life in Moscow, the Praxis Research and Education Center, which is uh, uh, praxiscenter.ru, it's easy to dial up, uh, where we are organized in all the countries of the former Soviet Union to have uh, be connected with uh, self-organized non-state labor unions, these new free unions, and uh, our organization is made up of people who identify as Marxists and people who identify as anarchists and syndicalists and radical Democrats. Uh, right now, we are trying to keep the peace movement alive in Moscow, and it is not a good situation with Putin in a hysterical mode of anti-Semitism, talking about the Jew Trotsky in the pay of Hitler. This is happening right now on TV. In real time, my friends in Moscow are, are telling me, and of course persecuting anybody that sympathized with the Ukrainian 
uh, uh, independence movement uh, or, or anything else as agents of the United States. And that all of this is a fascist push and manipulated behind the scenes uh, by Bush, who doesn't know what he wants to do, and the Europeans, who don't want to lend these people much money to see them pay it back to Putin. Any case, uh, what I'm saying is that anarchists and Marxists can and need to work together, but only when we've done what we did in praxis in Moscow. Year after year, we held international conferences. And people of the various tendencies, we had always our conferences were half historical and half practical. And we went over the history of the Russian Civil War, and the Marxists took responsibility for all the horrible things that were done, starting with Kronstadt, and the anarchists for the deficiencies of their philosophies, and increasingly involved in the ecological movement as well. And it seems to me that this is what has to happen in the West. In the hothouse Stalinist uh, and, uh, atmosphere of Russia, I guess it's easier to bring all these people together. I don't know. Victor Serge, whose books I've translated and uh, whose biography I'm writing, who was an anarchist, who then worked for the Bolsheviks, but never really put down his anarchism, uh, 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 he's a wonderful figure for all of you. How many have heard of, of or read Victor Serge? Okay. Well, that's the place to start if you're interested in this subject. Can you, someone, write Victor Serge on the board? Here, well, this is the latest book of his that I just came out, but I've been translating them since the 60s. And his memoirs of a revolutionary, he describes his youth in the anarchist movement, and then uh, in the syndicalist movement in Spain, and then the Russian Revolution, and so on. You can pass this around. And I'm going to stop right here. Yes? Okay. And just one last thing. This is my book where I talk about Victor Serge, and where I talk about praxis, and where I talk about this very problem of how to, to bring together these two philosophies. Because in France, where I spend half my time, in a town called Montpellier, which is about the size of Hartford, there are two Trotskyist groups, three Trotskyist groups, one of which has its own meeting hall, four anarchist groups, two of which have their own meeting halls. So that's been the problem. My conclusion is, yes, anarchism and Marxism must be complementary, must work together. But how the hell are we going to get the anarchists and the Marxists to work together? That's a problem I'll throw out uh, to you folks. Thank you for your patience. carry on at least one piece of the tradition, which is not to really answer any of the questions, but to raise or re-raise them, maybe with a little more substance than in the very short version we got. Um, I want to, my approach to Marxism and anarchism has always been, um, you know, I, I, I was never a lover of theory. So I guess, you know, being in the philosophy department, I'm kind of a bit of an interloper. Um, and I always, if I spent too much time in, in theory, I would start getting acrophobia and looking down and thinking I was going to fall into an abyss. Uh, so I would, my approach has always been to dip into various theories and sort of grab a piece and come back and see if I can ex understand the way the world is working uh, using the piece that I found at the moment. And, um, and I think that and it's not a bad habit to get into, is to, is, is to be anchored in some kind of real issue. And I think for most of us um, who are located in academe anyway, the, the issues either are understanding what's happening or understanding how to make progressive things happen. Um, the, sort of the scholarship and the activism, and I think a lot of the people in this room share my kind of uh, mixed 
um, mixture of those two things. There's some back and forth, and there's sometimes when you feel like both are consonant with each other, and sometimes you feel like uh, you've got to choose one over the other. Um, but lately, I think, for me anyway, uh, there's been quite a bit that has sort of meshed the two. Uh, all these very large, important, and very interesting and promising movements on a global scale. Uh, the four that I'd like to sort of call out um, are the huge movements in Argentina that began in 2001, uh, Tahrir Square and Tunisia, uh, the Arab Spring, <coughs> Occupy Wall Street, and the fourth one that I want to mention and, and come back to is the Iranian Revolution, um, which in some people's minds is continuing, but you know, for most of us it's a 1979 event. Quite a ways before, but I think it has a lot of current currency uh, that's worth looking at. And I think that what you can see in all these is that the, re, the, the rebirth or the revivication of the anarchist ideas is really kind of captured in these movements. And to me, I think the really biggest part of it and the most interesting part, exciting part of it, is the notion of a radical democracy that has emerged from these. And in Argentina, they, they came up with a wonderful term, horizontalidad, to describe their version of democracy in which they were trying to build movements and organizations and enterprises that were all based on absolutely no hierarchy at all, no designated leadership, no, uh, no authority systems other than everybody finding a consensus through some kind of horizontal relationships. And I think um, Argentina was, because it was early in the 21st century, I think it it became an inspiration and a model that a lot of other movements followed, including ultimately Tahrir Square and uh, uh, Occupy Wall Street. Um, and I think that they raised a lot of questions. And I, you know, if you look at Marina Citrin's work, uh, it's really not her work so much as her collaborative work with a lot of the activists in, in Argentina. They're really working very hard at trying to understand how to create and sustain these radically democratic movements. And uh, I, I want to focus our attention on that, because I think that, that the experience we've seen in these places so far really raises a really critical issue about them and about larger questions about social change and about progressive social change and socialism and all the issues that uh, we're, we're surely going to get into here. Uh, and to me, I think the big, the big question, the big question that has to be addressed is, are these movements that are based on radical democracy, horizontalidad, or whatever designation we want to give to them, can they sustain themselves? Now, Richard has already raised one of the big questions is what happens after you bring down the state, right? But I think you also need to ask the question, can you sustain yourselves long enough to bring down the state, right? That there's a kind of question of longevity here. Now, we can find examples of longevity, right? The trouble is that when we find them, we always find them in the context of great difficulty, things going wrong. That's why I think the Iranian Revolution is such a, uh, a, an important example. People don't, are not aware of this, but the Iranian Revolution had the look, very much the look of the Argentinian revolts in the early 21st century very decentralized, many, many different groups, of people organizing, people organizing very radically democratic uh, forms, uh, movements that were controlled by the people who were the participants in the movements, bringing more people in on the basis of those people guiding their own rights. And yet, at the and they did bring down, they did bring down the government there, right? And Khomeini, was a minor figure in the revolution. He was a major figure in the post-revolution because in that circumstance, the organization and the capacity for coordination that Khomeini's group had 
was capable of seizing the moment. Right. And I think that if we want to understand, if we want to understand the possibility for large-scale progressive social change, I think we have to understand that this radical democracy model is great, is really, it's proven itself in this era, at this moment, at really shaking the foundations of the system. Right? And what we haven't been able to understand, and what I'm not going to even propose answers to, I'm just going to raise this question. What we haven't been able to understand is how do you go about sustaining it for long enough to A, bring down the state, and then be erect something in the post-revolutionary moment that preserves those values and those initiatives and that energy that this kind of radical democracy actually generated. And so it's, I think that it's a question that's been asked in other forms, but I think in this era we need to ask it very specific to these forms. And I'm not, you know, I'm not sure where to go with the answer. I think that John Holloway, I would point every, you know, everybody to John Holloway's book, Crack Capitalism. Holloway's an interesting figure because he's a, you might call him a reformed Marxist. He's a kind of migrated from very rigorous Marxist analysis to very rigorous anarchist analysis, uh, mediated by his uh, involvement with the Zapatistas, who of course are another one of these exemplars of radical democracy that you know have occurred, and maybe we should even I should even make them prior to Argentina, though I think Argentina, in some ways, uh, you know, really took the Zapatista lesson and brought it to the world. Um, and th this book is an, an attempt to answer <coughs> that question and. Uh, I think he has a very interesting idea that I think is also flawed and that we really need to help him fix it. His idea in it is that uh, crack capitalism is not the way I would use the phrase crack capitalism, which uh, you know sounds like capitalism on crack, right? He's actually using the word crack as a, an imperative, as a verb. He's oh. saying crack it, crack it open. And what he, the vision he offers in the book is the idea that what we really need to do is to everybody, everybody put a crack in capitalism in the world in which they operate. So for us at Stony Brook, we'd have to operate within the Stony Brook confines and put a crack in it here. And if everybody, can, and, and if you keep doing that, and everybody does their little piece everywhere, eventually the whole thing will just tumble down. Right? And I don't think he's right. I think it's a <laughs> clever idea. But I don't think he's right. I don't think it can be done without some kind of coordination. Right? How are you going to do this? Get everybody to operate? You know, if you think about it for a second, it sounds like a great idea. But how are you going to get that coordination without having some meta-organization, which of course almost instantaneously violates our loyalty to these ideas of radical democracy? Non-hierarchical, no power over, only power with, and so on and so forth. Right? So um, I'm, I'm going to leave it right at that point and say that, that well, maybe I'm going to retreat back to um, something that Marx said and that maybe, uh, maybe that we need to always relearn, you know. He was once asked why he never really had visions of socialism. He would always say, we need socialism, and then he would never describe it. Why don't you describe it? You, you, you should by now understand what it needs to be. And he, and he said, I can't describe it because it has to be built by the people who built socialism. And maybe the answer to, uh, to this dilemma that I'm posing is that we can't figure it out. Maybe we can't figure it out. Maybe it has to be figured out on the run, in the process of a movement right. that is struggling with understanding this, trying to find the way, if I'm right, 
of coordinating the movements in such a way that you can really successfully, you know, make everything shake all at once and then shake it out. And then, in the immediate aftermath, ask the same question over again. You know, how do you then construct a post-revolutionary society that preserves the virtues of this radical democracy, but at the same time allows you to prevent Khomeini from coming in, or prevent whoever you want to designate as the problem that occurred after the revolution. And, but in every case, I think you'll see that those who ended up in charge after the revolution were the people who were well organized and really had formed an organization that was capable of coordinating in a very vast way, right? And if those are the bad guys, then that's who's going to get it. So um, I don't think, I don't think that the Zabatistas and the Argentinian, Argentinian, let's call them revolutionaries, um, are right in thinking that if they construct their own world in this tiny corner, right, that they can actually become the vanguard of something much larger. It, that's what we haven't seen. We haven't seen that the counter institutions, or however we want to designate, the liberated areas that people have, have found or created, we don't see those having a contagion effect. What John Holloway would like to see is that eventually everybody will join it. Instead, they become circumscribed and isolated, and eventually they will decay. Uh, if, if, they, if you don't expand, you're going to contract. So I, I, I hate to have a kind of dire, and I don't want to have a dire message because I'm really quite optimistic that there is an answer to this, but I don't have it. Thank you. Uh, is there some strategic necessity for speaking? No, you can speak. No? Okay. Yeah. So I'm much more comfortable right okay. here. And I, I'll project if there's a microphone embedded in that, I can call and see. All right. Um, so I'm going to try to grapple with some of the questions a little bit. Um, uh, and as a jumping off point, I, I actually really appreciated um, the mention of, of Zapatismo because it's something that I've actually engaged with quite a bit. I studied in the Zapatista Centro de Vencos in Oventique in 2008, and I was just in uh, Oventique again last summer in August for the 10-year anniversary of the Caracoles uh, Autonomous Municipalities. Um, and I think that it actually holds a good deal uh, useful for understanding uh, the intersection of these two uh, historical trajectories, I guess we can call them. Um, but before I get into that, I want to actually kind of stake out what makes these two things distinct for me, because I think that um, I come pretty much exclusively out of the anarchist tradition, um, and, and the reason why I defer to that tradition over the Marxist tradition is actually quite specific. And it's not because I have any sort of contempt or animosity toward Marxism. Um, for all intents and purposes, throughout its various permutations, whether we're talking about classical Marxism or critical Marxism or Marxist feminism or what have you, Marxism has taken as its object of analysis, typically, the matter of exploitation, right? Marxism's primary object of analysis, perhaps its signature and, and defining object of analysis, is exploitation. It's production relations. Um, so when we talk about feminism in the context of Marxism, we're talking about men exploiting women. Uh, when we talk about Marxism in art or culture or representation or colonialism or what have you, we're talking about the exploitative dimensions of those realities. Anarchism, uh, by contrast, you see this um, you see this in varying ways across the tradition, but anarchism takes as its primary object of analysis domination. And there are relationships of domination in which exploitation is not taking place. Not every form of domination is an exploitative one. Heteronormative 
and heteropatriarchal domination, for instance, is not altogether an exploitative relation. There are ways in which it expresses itself that have nothing to do with extracting value or, or subordinating somebody's labor. Uh, that said, that form of domination is still nonetheless utterly and 100% insidious and worthy of, of abolishing. Um, I don't think anybody would actually contest that. But Marxism is not necessarily a sufficient lens for looking at that aspect of that relation. Um, and oftentimes, anarchism has proved insufficient to the task as well, inasmuch as anarchists have not understood themselves as being under the obligation to interrogate all forms of domination. Um, having made that distinction, I think that's where Zapatismo gets really interesting. Um, and I come out of, uh, I'm actually a high school dropout, so I don't come out of, I, I have a love for theory and a love for rigorous intellectual life and, and such, so I, I, don't, I don't invoke that as a way of like distancing myself from uh, disciplined critical inquiry. Um, but much of my understanding and my, my sort of analysis of things comes from my experience within social movements and, and within particular prefigurative projects that I've been part of. Um, Zapatismo offers something very, very crucial and might actually be both a way of negotiating these two trajectories and also maybe sort of like a third little step-brother of some sort, maybe, or stepsister, maybe. Um, in that, um, I'm actually going to disagree with Michael about uh, Zapatismo in terms of it understanding itself as uh, uh, a self-contained sort of vanguard. Um, the Zapatista Rebellion originated with a sort of classically Marxist-Leninist group, like a cadre from Mexico City, that uh, went down to Chiapas to sort of uh, inspire or provoke the indigenous into a rebellion. <coughs> into actually, the opening communique from the Zapatistas declares war on the Mexican state. It actually has a very sort of Marxist-Leninist tone to it, right? Um, but what happened was they got down there and the indigenous were kind of like, yeah, this thing you guys are talking about is kind of cool. Uh, but um, in case you didn't notice, we kind of got our own thing going on, too. Um, and you know, and this is actually like a really good historical sort of parable, because I think it actually represents what we see in so much of social movement organizing now, particularly the ways in which privilege, race, gender, all these other sorts of things are expressed. And that you have people who sort of uh, attempt to speak to or represent other people to themselves and prescribe uh, solutions or prognoses or ways of moving forward that do not actually come from the people most disproportionately impacted by the forms of domination at work in, in that particular landscape. Um, and so this is where we get the expression of of colonialism or activist colonialism within social movements, right, is precisely what this cadre from Mexico City was attempting to do, right? Um, and so Zapatismo is a sort of spiritual element to it in that it has a number of kind of proverbs that animate it. One of them um, uh, Richard kind of touched on. They have this phrase, uh, caminamos preguntando, like we, we, walking we ask questions, right? Which is sort of a variation of we make the path by walking, right? was that we're going to move, but we're going to continue asking questions, and we're not going to make movement contingent upon having everything figured out. That we're going to ask questions as we go, but we are going to ask questions, right? And we're going to revise and whatever, but we're going to move. And another proverb that they have, and this is probably really the most central one for me, and for what I want to sort of express, is uh, un mundo donde quepan muchos mundos, a world in which many worlds fit. Right? So that there isn't one sort of thread, there isn't one narrative, there isn't one solution, there isn't one uh, reconstructive vision or sort of preferred outcome. That what we want is a world in which many worlds can fit, right? in which many anti-authoritarian expressions can cohabitate and collaborate and cross-pollinate. Right? That's a really crucial innovation. Right? Um, and, and I. I would actually argue that the Zapatista Rebellion does precede uh, Argentina in as much as it was directly influential in the Seattle uprising of 1999 against the World Trade Organization, which was the explosion that put anarchism 
and anti-capitalism back on the map in the United States in some meaningful way. Um, and we saw in the Seattle uprising, in limited ways, but we saw a world in which many worlds fit. The sort of Teamsters and Turtles sort of thing that came out of that of environmentalists collaborating with feminist groups and indigenous groups and labor unions and what have you. This was an expression of Zapatismo in the United States, even if it wasn't calling itself such. Um, and in fact, uh, later that year when the IMF meetings were uh, protested in Prague, uh, a clever British guy whose name I can't remember made a documentary about it called Man Bites Dog or Man Bites Cop or State or something. I don't remember. It. But he, he sort of made this documentary about the Prague protests and as a sort of like, it toggled between footage of the protests and a narrative of the protests and a sort of creative reenactment of Subcomandante Marcos from the Zapatista sitting in a room with a chessboard sort of pretending to orchestrate all of it and pretending to sort of be like this, this puppet master in the background, that, that he was sort of having this playful, uh, being a conductor of these, of these expressions of anti-capitalism that were happening in that moment. The reason that these two things are really signature for me is that one of the key features of history and historical social revolutions for me is that in almost any case in which we cite a revolution being a sort of um, a cataclysmic upheaval, right? A disjuncture in a linear historical narrative. In any case in which we can locate that, the result is oftentimes, or almost always, as bad, if not worse, than the regime that it overthrew. We can see that in the Russian Revolution. We can see that in the uh, overthrow of apartheid in South Africa. We can see that in any number of places in which these sorts of revolutions have occurred. Um, part of the reason is that it's not simply a matter of having the right idea or organizing people in the right way. It's also about creating new subjects because the, our notions of self, are we aren't stable. Selves aren't stable. Selves are socially constituted. Everybody in this room is a carrier of particular discourses, notions, assumptions, presumptions, uh, the ways in which power and privilege speak through us at any given time is its own grammar. It allows certain utterances and disallows others. And we're not even aware of it. It speaks through us all the time without us ever even knowing. How many people here speak a language other than English? Right? So in English, we have a preoccupation and a predisposition toward really intensely identifying with emotions in a permanent way. I am hungry. I am sleepy. The only other two languages that I have any command of are Latin-based languages. And in those languages, those are senses that one has. They're not something that one is, right? So just in that, we can see that things, language speaks through us as much as we speak through it. And social forces speak through us as much as we are subject to them. Anarchism and the opposition to domination requires of us a constant vigilance against the ways in which these discourses and social forces speak through and produce us and we have to create new forms of producing new selves. And this isn't a new idea. There was an anarchist by the name of Gustav Landauer who dabbled in Jewish mysticism and, and, and who was executed in the Bavarian Revolution, who said, we are the state and we will continue to be the state until we have devised <coughs> new relations and learned to behave differently and forge the forms of community that will result in a, a genuine brotherhood or community. This is what makes anarchism distinct, is that it is a process of interrogating subjectivity and reproducing new forms of subjectivity. And this is where Zapatismo is really interesting. And the example I want to give is that I spent six years co-founding and working in worker cooperatives. Uh, I, I made my living for a time as a professional dog walker, and I decided that I didn't want to work for agencies anymore, and I already knew how to run it. So I teamed up with some friends, and we created a worker-owned, completely communist, uh, dog walking agency in Washington DC and I handled the cold calls from new clients and you can imagine in Washington DC who one's clients would be if you're a professional dog walker congressional staffers top five corporate lawyers IMF employees you know not <coughs> conventional allies in these sorts of things right but they'd say okay I need my dog walked Monday Tuesday and Thursday and I'd say great okay this is what you're looking for this is what it's gonna cost and what I'm about to tell you, no other agency will tell you, but everybody here owns this, is paid the same no matter what they put in, 
has access to full health benefits, and has six weeks annually paid vacation. And that every decision we make here is completely democratic. And nine times out of 10, but keep in mind who these people were, nine times out of 10, the answer I got back was, wow, can I come work for you? <laughs> right? And so anarchism, as a, as a discipline, as an analysis, it's not about like, whether we even have reference to this classical tradition or this identity, this notion of like, almost anarchism as like a party, like I'm a card-carrying anarchist. I circle my A's as though that means anything to anybody. Right? It's actually about that methodology, that anarchism is defined by that methodology of interrogating domination at all levels. Right? And if anybody's read the preface to anti oedipus that Foucault wrote, you see this, him talking about getting, getting down with and, and, and abolishing the fascist in all of us, the fascist that's like in the body, not just the fascism of the state or the military or, or whatever. But this is what makes anarchism dynamic and meaningful, and it's not necessarily expressed in the ways that we conventionally think of historically, and Occupy really embodied this in a way that I think people always miss. And that is that, People kept asking, well, what's your, what's your demand, right? Because occupy and occupation as a verb is conventionally, and has conventionally, especially coming out of Tahrir and all these other things, associated with the seizure of a political space almost as a hostage situation, right? We're gonna hold this until you motherfuckers give up something, right? Whatever it is that we want. What happened was that people kind of queered that word. Suddenly, there was occupy Judaism, occupy the Department of Education, Occupy, and it just became this thing that ceased to be about something temporally constrained, something that had an endpoint. It started to be about an ongoing reclamation. We're taking this shit back, and we're not ever giving it up. And we're gonna remake it, and we're gonna decolonize it, and we're gonna make it liberatory. And we're never giving it back. It's not about seizing this thing. And that was what actually tapped the vein and made that movement dynamic and made it a threat. 5,000 people at a New York DOE meeting refusing to comply with a vote to close schools. And it didn't happen in Zuccotti. And that notion of reclamation, that notion of seizure, is really vibrant. And I'm gonna close with one quick anecdote from Zapatista territory, because we're talking about, well, how do we resolve this contradiction of these anarchist methodologies that then don't express themselves in high politics later on, that this is the contradiction, right? And that's certainly what's happened in Egypt and happened in all these other places, right? I had a course uh, at the Centro de Lenguas about Zapatismo and women. And maybe some of you know, but the first uprising that Zapatistas talk about happened before 1994. It was the uprising of women within Zapatista communities when they established what's called the Women's Revolutionary Law. And one of the things that they stipulated was, yeah, they stipulated a number of things. No more drinking, because when you guys drink, we get beaten. Um, we have the right to decide how many children we have, whether that has to do with birth control or abortion or what have you, all these sorts of things. And, um, and this was laid out and mandated, and they said, oh, and by the way, until you begin adopting and enforcing these things, we're just gonna block every attempt you make to consensus on any decision. So nothing will get done until you deal with this. And that's what happened. They said, well, fuck, we need to get shit done, so let's deal with the women. Um, and two Swedish women that were in my class put this question to this young Zapatista woman and said, okay, well, you have the right to decide how many children you'll have, but the only state in this country in which abortion can be legally practiced is the state of Mexico, not the state of Chiapas. Also, 95% of Zapatistas are practicing Catholics, which means the dominant mores are sort of not altogether supportive of birth control and, and, and these sorts of things. So how do you resolve that contradiction? Like how is this right you have practiced? And she looked at her without blinking as though it was the most absurd question she'd ever heard and said, it's a process. Like why on earth would you think that we would resolve this in under 17 years? People have to be transformed and come to terms with this and that that ongoing process is the process. It is us walking and asking questions. And I think that that really, like rethinking anarchist politics in that way, rethinking it as a critique of domination that is constantly ongoing and constantly remaking subjectivity is the crucial sort of element that needs to be sort of foregrounded away from the sort of classically historical traditions that we're talking about. That's it. follow suit and also sit uh, here.
Um, I uh, actually prepared uh, written remarks, so forgive me. Um, I will try to keep them uh, brief so we can get to question and answer as soon as possible. First, I just want to thank uh, Platypus and all my fellow uh, uh, participants here. It's been really exciting so far to hear your talks. Um, the request today uh, is to discuss Marxism and anarchism. Uh, what do these terms mean? Are these ideologies, as Platypus's event description suggests? Are these philosophies, systems, movements? Can you be a Marxist? Can you be an anarchist? Are these really options at the moment? What does it mean to contrast them here at Stony Brook, Long Island, New York, the United States in 2014? Uh, as I go on, I want to leave these sort of questions in the air. Think about them. Uh, as Divya mentioned at the beginning, Marxism and anarchism arose as reactions and prognoses of crisis. As Marx famously framed the theater of 19th century politics, the imperializing bourgeoisie of the Industrial Revolution had massively developed and centralized the means of production from country to town, from global south to global north, with a concurrent political centralization of the modern nation states and an international division of labor, generating a global regime of production, world capitalism. For Marx, the double destiny of capitalism was supposed to consist in first, generating enough resources to globally abolish material deprivation and class society, and second, generating the global political subject capable and motivated to direct these new resources to their millennial task. Between the two moments of this destiny, capitalism's culmination and its self-abolition, Marx foresaw a crisis in which capitalism would accomplish its productive goal, but retain its hierarchical political control of that production necessitating a struggle by the majority of the world's population for the collective control of the prosperity it had created. Marxism and anarchism famously diverged on this point, at this point, on the notion, nature of the struggle, both its method and its goals. Whether or not the struggle should involve taking over the machinery of capitalism and the nation state, whether or not the collective control of world prosperity should be centralized in egalitarian or decentralized and libertarian, in the wake of the revolutions of 1848, Marx and the classical anarchist like Bakunin both anticipated these questions would soon be determined by the unfolding struggles between the workers' movements and the European nation-states. Capitalism, however, had other plans, and from 1848 to 1871 to 1917 to 1968 to 2008, crises have broken out only to be absorbed by a higher level of capitalist consolidation. According to this radical temporality of capitalist consolidation, crisis, and communization, we have been suspended between the categories of consolidation and crisis for over 150 years. <coughs> so what does it mean to be a Marxist or an anarchist in this logically suspended moment of world history? Let me dispense with two answers to this question that I will not be considering, <laughs> since they have evolved abandoning the world historical meanings of the terms. First, a progressive eclecticism that sees Marxism or anarchism as historical sources for reform proposals to the liberal nation state. Second, a radical ethics that sees Marxism or anarchism as guides to the making of individual life choices, or worse, as abstract belief systems to rationalize life as usual. In order to coherently articulate either of these visions, I think we have to pose them against the horizon of global politics. In my remarks, I'll first suggest what globality means for Marxism and anarchism. Second, consider several recent international manifestations of radical politics in that light. And third, comment on the state of left politics in the US with reference to several major types of political intervention and their possibilities. Thankfully, I'll be doing all of these things very schematically. So there's not seven hours of talk left. Um, <laughs> you know, already know it the rest of my career, yeah. Um, so, uh, globality, Marxism, and anarchism. Globality is the horizon of left politics. Without it, left theory is cut away from its proper object of inquiry, and so develops irreconcilable aporias, or theoretical impasses. Key among these aporias is the idea of an outside of capitalism. The anarchist tradition in particular has sometimes proposed non-capitalist ways of life or strategies of communal cooperation as forms of resistance to capitalism. One might think here not only of Kropotkin, but also numerous 20th century attempts to spontaneously socialize farms and factories. <coughs> Here, the Marxist tradition has differed in demonstrating the totality of capitalism, which is to say that capitalism is a global regime of production. It directly produces the life of almost the lives of almost all the world's population and conditions the reality of absolutely every world inhabitant. Opting out of capitalism is not, in this sense, a credible approach, since it is the ground and context of our current existence. The only other of capitalism would be an alternative global regime, politically organized otherwards otherwise. 
Radical political thought at its radix rejects the proposition that this state of affairs is either desirable or necessary. Capitalism, the current global regime, must be replaced by a different state of affairs. At this point, the more contemporary anarchist tradition rejoins the conversation with Marxism to envision global alternatives, agreeing, in effect, that the maxim, think globally, act locally, is woefully insufficient. This disconnect of global theory and local practice severs the practical spinal cord of radical politics. The condition of real politics is global action. And the crucial theoretical question is how global political action can occur to end capitalism. By way of situating anarchism and Marxism, I suggest that the conceptual end of this global regime can logically take four forms. First, a negative disintegration of the global regime. This would be apocalypse. Uh, the po or the positive disintegration of the regime into a horizontally organized libertarian system of micro-regimes. This would be the world in which many worlds are possible or world anarchism. Uh, then a negative uh, transformation of the regime into one global biotechnological tyranny or a positive transformation of the regime into one global egalitarian regime which would be world communism. Here I'm suggesting that the difference between Marxism and anarchism at the level of global politics for the sake of this discussion, I'm focusing on the difference between a global system of micro-regimes versus macro-regime. Uh, a major current of anarchism eschews the formulation of global politics, deferring the task to a free global consensus in the future. To theorize the political tasks of peoples in other places, let alone a universal global task, is seen as imperialist or authoritarian. What is some dissent? Is it really acceptable to write off deep local dissents as false consciousness? This current leads to an opportunist gradualism that reacts to local unrest and insurrectionary situations by seeking to promote horizontal strategies in the context of either vertically strategic or unstrategic mass movements. Given the overwhelming pressure for these horizontal strategies to be isolated and subsumed, I would suggest that this local and piecemeal strategy doesn't take seriously the imperative to global action. There are, however, several versions of anarchism that do take seriously the imperative to global action. As anarchist theory increasingly articulates a global politics, it becomes increasingly credible as an alternative to capitalism. So there are three kinds, I would suggest, of uh, globally serious anarchism that I would like to put forth. One is what I would call passive rupture anarchisms. These are anarchisms that foresee a big uh, coming uh, political economic rupture or crisis. Uh, and that crisis itself will give rise to a kind of anarchy and this somewhat relies on a somewhat stable idea of humanism, people being either intrinsically good or evolutionary willingly to collaborate, a la Karpotkin or Jacques Kamat, anarcho-primitivist, this sort. A second would be active rupture anarchisms. Uh, these are, would be people interested in armed or insurrectionary anarchism. Here we might recall that Kropotkin did advocate direct and armed struggle against the state in order to free up societies to develop mutual aid. Machno's name has already been mentioned. Also, under active rupture anarchisms, you might put Hart and Negri's autonomism, Nick Land's accelerationism, communization theory, theory communist, tycoon, endnotes, uh, all of these sort of ones thinking about the way in which capitalist logic will enable some sort of exit according to its own logic, uh, or that it'll abolish itself. Um, the third sort of uh, globally political anarchism would be transhuman anarchisms. Uh, the first would be cultural transhumanism, in which you're trying to culturally change the kind of beings that people are. I'd argue that this is actually where Occupy fits in. Uh, and this is, you know, changing forms of different subjectivities, as this, uh, you know, Zapatismo is here as well. There's techno-transhuman anarchists who are, who are quasi-accelerationists. They sort of foresee the development of new kinds of technology enabling different forms of social organization and making that possible. And here are people who are singularity people, techno-gnostics. Biological transhuman anarchists who are interested in the genetic engineering possibilities and also food engineering. And finally, there are post-structural anarchists like Todd May, for instance, who are interested in uh, rethinking the political from that side. That said, each of these global scale anarchisms has problems, although they're all very interesting in many ways. Uh, Rupture-based anarchism, whether active or passive, faces aporias of political subject formation and goal envisioning. The aporia of political subject formation is that a salutary rupture would require either an optimistic theory of human nature or a coherent plan for organizing that would prepare subjects to intentionally manifest this post-rupture world. This pedagogy is confounded by the aporia of political teleology, or end of envisioning. Since the rupture must not be the result of a central plan, it must be more or less unanticipatable, and so it resists use as a pedagogical tool. In my own experience, rupture-based theory tends to discourage, and this is sort of uh, in the context of union organizing, 
Uh, but we could talk more about that in Q&A. Transhuman anarchism goes some distance towards solving this problem. We can envision the sort of subjects that need to be created for a global anarchism to function, and that global transhuman vision could replace a larger global political vision. However, transhuman anarchism faces the question of global coordination. And this is the, uh, what Michael Schwartz was bringing up about larger scale coordination of these efforts. Who is going to decide what sort of new subject this will be? How will the transformation be affected? And I'd suggest that the Marxist answer to these questions, the direct articulation of a global political regime based on universal claims, is the more coherent. The main objections against this vision of global politics are that its hierarchy and that its coercive power make it intrinsically unjust and bound to fail at its communistic task. However, the critique of hierarchy fails at the level of global politics, where abstract representation is needed to coordinate massive populations on issues like the environment. The critique of coercion fails at the level of micro-level communal organization, uh, where social patterns uh, require some degree of control, let alone the coercion that would be needed if hierarchical structure is shown to be necessary. So, uh, uh, finally, the articulation of a centralized global political project such as Marxism, has the additional advantage of creating the political conditions for many of the most fruitful anarchist strategies to be implemented as ways to deepen the democracy and self-sufficiency of local communities. And I'd suggest that here um, uh, Richard's remarks about uh, anarchism being a pole of pushing in a certain direction, pushing Marxists to be attentive to self-sufficiency and uh, democracy considerations is what I'm trying to get out there. So in any case, I'll uh, leave off um, but I think that it would be interesting to investigate these questions. Um, oh, well, in any case, we could also talk about why I think crisis is inevitable. Uh, I, think cri I, think, I, think, I think crisis is inevitable, either economically or environmentally. And given the inevitability of crisis, um, uh, Marxism has much to learn from the rich ideas and experiments of anarchism, while anarchism can draw from Marxism a more coherent concept of global politics. So. allow our panelists about two to four minutes to respond to each other, just to go over what you guys talked about very, very briefly. Um, so Richard, you were talking about um, Marxism and anarchism as providing um, necessary correctives to each other within the context of a kind of revolutionary internationalism. Um, Michael, you talked about, you brought up um, the Iranian Revolution and the Arab Spring, and talked about these horizontal movements and proponents of radical democracy, um, but as needing some kind of coordination, some kind of um, direction. Um, Joshua, you talked about Zapatismo and um, made some distinctions between Marxism as being um, having as its object exploitation, whereas anarchism as having as its object domination, um, which allows for a kind of process of creating the new subject while um, opposing um, dom domination. Uh, so revolution has also been creating. Um, and finally, Adam, you talked about um, the origin of Marxism and anarchism in crisis, um, and uh, how we have moments of crisis and consolidation repeatedly. Um, and what's needed to um, grapple with that is not a reformist politics or some kind of ethics, um, but a negotiation of the global horizon um, that capitalism defines. Um, and we can start with Richard, if you wanted to sure. respond. Sure. Well, uh, very briefly, these were wonderful presentations I've really heard about. Uh, I'd like to add a little bit to each one. Uh, to, to Adam, I loved your classifications, but I felt a little left out because Marxist humanism and libertarian Marxism and uh, the kind of ideas of self-organization that Rosa Luxemburg uh, talked about and uh, her analysis precisely that social movements do better when there is no party directing them than when there is. This is the Marxism that I've defended all my life. Similarly, that Joshua's, again, I very much appreciate that you concentrated on domination. 
but I wouldn't draw the line between Marxism and uh, anarchism so clearly there, since Marxism starts with Hegel's critique of the master and slave relationship, but it's all about identities and domination and so on. So I think there again, it's a little bit more complicated, and I guess because of my own position, it's better to draw from both and enrich each other uh, rather than necessarily to oppose. Oh, and by the way, on the subject of centralization, uh, the, the, the Marxism of so-called Marxism of Stalin and his successors, and even of Lenin to an extent when he was in a completely impossible situation, uh, but uh, centralization of that kind is not necessarily a Marxist solution. Uh, the Soviets, it seems to me, and there are many Marxists who are, call themselves council communists, okay? And who are, for, uh, uh, it seems to me, if there's any chance for the future, it would be an international council of, uh, or regional uh, planetary council uh, based on local uh, Soviets, local councils, local assemblies, and so on. And so now I'll uh, get, back, get to uh, Michael's uh, report, which I'm really thrilled to. And I've been thinking and working along the same lines. I'm particularly touched because the Iranian Revolution, which was put together by feminists, Marxists, factory councils and, and unions and so on. And by the way, the Stalinist Communist Party, the truth have played a very negative role on it. And in one point, didn't they support the Ayatollahs? Oh, yeah. But the, the, the problem is this, that we can't have, on the one hand, organization, and on the other hand, no organization. And it's true that all of these revolutions get hijacked by centralized groups, either the Ayatollah or others that can send in their troops. And, uh, uh, and take over. So the real problems are being discussed here, uh, and, and they're about how can self-organized groups defend themselves? How can self-organized groups uh, take over? Well, to me, as a, as a revolutionary and a historian of revolutions, the answers, although very, very complicated, are simple. Revolutions can only persist if they deepen themselves, if they start asking the social questions and interfere with the patterns of domination and exploitation, okay? And revolutions can only survive by growing. If the Arab Spring had spread more and more rapidly, if, 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 we've got to say that the world is in crisis and that uh, uh, Adam is pr perfectly right not only is capitalism due for a shock that's going to make 2008 uh, look like a, a, a little flutter in the markets, uh, they're destroying the world, and everybody knows it, okay? Except that they own the media, so you're not allowed to talk about it. But we all know that it's going to happen. And if there isn't something like a worldwide, bottom-up revolution organized on a planetary scale within the next uh, a couple of decades, forget it. Just forget it, okay? Now, is this possible? Well, here you're gonna have to categorize me with, what do they call them, the techno-humanoids or something? <laughs> <laughs> My book, which I passed around, which you can download free from the internet, uh, uh, is all about, is another world really possible? And beginning in 1997, when I was invited to South Africa to a meeting of a, to form a kind of a international, I realized that the internet makes this possible. The internet makes the dreams, for example, like my teacher Castoriadis, who wrote in the 50s about uh, the content of socialism, how the economy and the world could be regulated from the bottom up. The internet makes this possible. And machine translation, I'm a translator, but I'm very happy to be replaced by a machine in political documents and discussions between women's groups and peasants' groups and so on, all around the globe. It can take place in real time 
thanks to this. So I see that world government and regionalism and cooperation, by the way, Marx was a great supporter of cooperatives. He said the two great achievements of the British working class were trade unions and cooperatives. I was over time, so I'll sit down. Uh, there's way too much uh, content for me to comment on everything I would like to talk about. I, I, I want to pick up what Richard was just talking about and um, sort of add some depth to it. Um, you know, I like the, um, the phrase of rupture anarchism uh, that Adam gave us, and I, maybe he, uh, I, I think it's an echo of something that, uh, uh, that Holloway also speaks about. And I think it's uh, important to, to call out the question he asked about that was, is there some fundamental humanism in people that would really allow people in a, in a chaotic situation to find a collective humanist resolution to their problems. And you know, there's a phenomenal book called uh, Paradise Built in Hell by a woman named Rebecca Solnit that basically answers this question. She looks at catastrophes. Uh, she, she actually chooses six, starting with the uh, San Francisco earthquake, Mexican earthquake, she goes to Katrina, she goes to 9-11, and she says, what happens in situations like this where the organized social structure has been wiped out, at least in some parts of some of these places? And what she finds going on, that's why she calls it paradise built in hell, is a, a kind of anarchist utopia in which there's a huge amount of sharing, which everybody has a collective attitude, People find their collectivity and work together. And the only contaminant in the situation, in most of these situations, is that the elites, of course, mm -hmm. are so desperately frightened that they're going to be swallowed up by the chaos that they usually have an army that's capable of ruining everything. Yep. Um, uh, it's a wonderful book, but, it, but it, it is her point to answer that question. And I think it's the most persuasive answer I've had to that, which is, left to their own devices, people really will organize something egalitarian, radically democratic, uh, collectively, a, a collect, a, for the collective welfare, and to protect the individuals within it. I mean, it, it's, it's a beautiful argument for the possibility that if only we could have that global catastrophe, right, that would wipe out the existing governments, people would probably spontaneously find something really beautiful. And they would do it in a local level and they would find a way of coordinating with each other. Unfortunately, I don't think that we can expect even the global capitalist crisis. You know, I spent my, the first part of my indulgence in, uh, in really trying to understand Marx, right, assuming that he was saying that what was going to happen is there's going to be a penultimate crisis that's going to take capitalism down, and then people will only have the job of erecting something better in its, in its, uh, in its place. Um, when, I, when I really got deeply involved in looking at history, I realized that that's not going to happen. It's just not going to happen. We've had just a, as good a crisis as you want to have. <laughs> you can choose the ones, you, you can choose your favorite, right? There, we're not going to get a crisis that brings down capitalism. It has to be brought down. Ah. It has to be human agency in this. There has to be a moment when the people decide that they're going to take it down. And um, you know, and I share the, 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 the view that it's a global system, so there's a way in which we need to have a global re a revolution. And I, then I just come back to my own, my own worries, right? which is, how do we build that? If we have to build it, how do we build it? You know, because most of the models we have have proven themselves to fall short in one way or another. You know? uh, and I don't, I don't share the idea that all these revolutions, they've, they've given successor regimes that are as bad as, uh, if not worse than the others. I don't think that's, I don't think that's true. I think that a lot of these revolutions have generated regimes, however much we want, we want to criticize them, much better than the regime they replaced. And I would include that in that the Iranian revolution, 
I'm just reading some statistics on the degree of inequality and the, uh, the, the level of education and the degree of, uh, uh, you know, the health of the children. I mean, the difference between 1979 and now is so fantastic. It's really very hard uh, to not say, okay, this regime is a horrible regime, but there are degrees of horribleness and the Shah was worse. And the revolutions do succeed at least at that level, at least some of them. But if we're really looking to establish something that we can be proud of, then I, I'm, I'm back to my same dilemma. Yeah, I'm, I'm piqued by this notion of, of the fulcrum of crisis you brought up, because I think it actually um, kind of a common thread uh, all of the comments that have been made today. Um, and um, incidentally, uh, Rebecca Solnit is the sister of David Solnit, who was central to the organization of the Seattle Uprising in 1999. Mm -hmm. They are, uh, they come from good stock. Um, <laughs> he's still a major organizer. I think he's based in the Bay Area. Does a lot yeah. of stuff with protest puppets and stuff. Really good guy. Um, the the thing that kept coming up for me with people talking about crisis was, uh, for people who've read it, the opening passage of Naomi Klein's The Shock Doctrine, where she quotes Milton Friedman saying that the direction that societies take in moments of crisis is effectively down to the ideas that are laying around when the shit hits the fan. Um, and we see this in Katrina, we see this, you know, of course, Solnit's example is, is an interesting one, right? Because we saw this in any number of places, right? The earthquake in Pakistan and all these sorts of instances in which people do, in many instances, come together in these sort of organic, self-organized forms of, of mutual aid and support. And we saw this even in Tahrir during the January, January 25 revolution, right? You had people doing that. Same with Benghazi in Libya before, not Benghazi in the way that it gets talked about here, but before things happened at the embassy, uh, before, uh, before the regime even came down, Benghazi was kind of this place where we, some of us were joking around and saying anarchism is too important to be left to the anarchists. Uh, because Benghazi was really self-organized and really kind of doing its own thing. You also have examples of this in Syria right now, where uh, places that have been liberated from the regime and are not overrun by Islamists are um, organized along really incredibly self-organized and uh, in, some, in some cases explicitly anarchist-inspired. Um, there's a, an anarchist who recently died named Omar Aziz, who was a Syrian physician and political prisoner under Assad, who was he identified as an anarchist and was heavily involved in influencing the revolution. Um, but at the same time, these fissures that are created by crises create openings for uh, sort of market fundamentalism to really sweep in, right? And, and I think that this is the, uh, the contradiction that we have to deal with, that uh, if sufficient forms, and the reason I brought up uh, working in a cooperative is that, that working in, in spaces like that involves our becoming dexterous with new forms, our becoming practiced and capable at new forms of organizing and new forms of production, new forms of service provision, and that these become ideas laying around when the shit hits the fan. And that the degree to which we can be responsive and count on each other to be responsive and, and successful in moments of crisis, whether they are inevitable or whether we bring them about, is that we, uh, we have to be able to, to take our hands and put them on the plow and actually be able to move it in some way. Um, I'm, I'm not sure how many people in this room are in business programs, um, and maybe we want to ask why. Um, if we don't think that being in a history program is going to level our ethics or our our integrity, uh, perhaps being in business programs wouldn't either. Um, but to the extent to which we refuse to require those skills, we don't have any ideas laying around when crisis happens. And that, I think, is really like a signature sort of uh, lacuna in, in resolving these two trajectories and putting them in the conversation. Is, you know, the Marxists want a sort of more organized and structured form. Not that anarchists don't fetishize organization either. Um, I've sat in tedious organizing yeah. meetings. Um, you know, it's like days of war, nights of meetings. Um, but like, but we really don't produce ideas at the rate that we need to, and, and produce dexterity and practical, tactile dexterity with new forms 
in the ways that we need to in order to be more than sort of like a room having a conversation when shit hits the fan. And I think that that's really like the missing link. Uh, yeah, I also really enjoyed all the talks. Um, let me see. Uh, so, cri uh, crisis. Um, uh, one of the things that was coming up in a couple of different people's talks, I definitely agree with those uh, folks who've remarked so far that, uh, you know, crisis is definitely not some, you know, deus ex machina or something. That's, you, know, you know, it's absolutely a political task, the response to crisis. Um, both, it, both generating it in a certain way and responding to it. Uh, and I, I took Joshua's point of, you know, the, our, our understandings, our set of concepts that we have to make sense of it is uh, crucial. Uh, one of the things that occurred to me as I was thinking about uh, Marxism and anarchism is, uh, in the, is, a, is a set of arguments that I used to have uh, back during um, being a union organizer, working with the uh, Hotel Workers Rising campaign. Uh, and, it was, and it was very much a, uh, you know, one of the things that occurred to us is the kind of work you do generates a bunch of concepts from doing that kind of work. If you, and, I, and so, for instance, one of the things I've always been deeply grateful to working with anarchist comrades, even though I don't identify as an anarchist, is that uh, since anarchists set themselves the task of figuring out how can we really, in a deep and profound way, engage with differences among different groups of people who we're working with, how can we generate spontaneity, how can we reach out to people, they often have some of the most extremely sophisticated ways of thinking about the way in which politics affect people's subjectivity, differences between the different people you're working with, and the local as the sphere of organizing. So I, I, and I think it's a result of the type of question they pose to themselves in praxis. Whereas on the other hand, Marxists, particularly internationalist Marxists, relentlessly over and over like rack themselves over the question, sitting with comrades from other countries, sitting with comrades all over the place thinking about what would it really mean to build collective decision making? What would it mean to make a strategic decision taking into account the state of affairs somewhere in another part of the world? And I think that it's, that's part, partially why a lot of Marxist comrades of mine have always been inspiring to me in their ability to think about the large scale coordination of those local issues. Um, so I think that that's something that's come up even in this discussion. I just wanted to say something about crisis, though. Uh, all the way at the beginning, I agreed with what you said, Richard, about uh, this crisis is going to make other crises look, uh, you know, small by comparison. And this is also somewhat a response to your remarks, Michael, to, to the effect of um, the crisis won't, you know, it's not going to be such a, a great crisis that will... Um, solve everything. I would like to absolutely keep open the possibility of it being an apocalyptic crisis as opposed to a happy one. But, I, but you know, but, I, but uh, two remarks. One, uh, the work of Tony Smith and uh, several other uh, uh, left economists and Marxist economists who've made the point that we shouldn't attribute to capitalism magic crisis subsuming powers. That, you know, the, the, the overcomings of crises in the past are specific. And so the welfare state as a solution and neoliberalism as a specific solution to two specific crises, instead of saying, well, capitalism is going to swallow every single crisis that ever comes. And so Tony Smith and a lot of other uh, Marxist economists have been trying to resuscitate the traditional theory of crisis and say, it still has some persuasive value if, in fact, we shouldn't just say, well, of course, we learned it was wrong because welfare state. The second one is ecological, and I want to just expand on it just a tiny bit which is that the uh, Tyndall Center for Climate Change Research, a group of uh, climate scientists uh, recently have begun making the claim, and Naomi Klein has taken it up in a number of people, that the very, their argument, and this is as climate scientists, is that the very existence of corporations like Exxon is a guarantee of catastrophic climate change. Absolutely. And in order to save ourselves, it'll become existentially necessary to socialize the means of production. If that's so, that vastly changes the stakes in global political organization. If it comes to the point where there you can globally build awareness that we have to organize at the level of the globe, a lot of these sort of debates about, oh, should we be local or global, take on a really different tenor. And so I think that that's, uh, you know, but I think those other two negative possibilities, either an apocalypse or a global biotechnical tyranny that will resolve those issues, those stand. And I think that that's why you can't just be like, oh, you know, I'm a left leftist, you know, television watcher. You know, no, no, we gotta work hard. You know, so, uh, so yeah. So in any case, yeah. But I, I, I I'd like to let, let it over to uh, question and answer. Although there's lots of things to talk about, obviously. So we have a little bit of time um, for Q and A. Um, we have one question over here that we can begin with. 
Yeah, uh, this will be my first and last question. So I will pose to you a sort of um, thought exercise. Uh, beginning with the uh, social organization, you say, from Hurricane Katrina and other natural disasters, where the people sort of organize in uh, anarchist methods of the communal organization. These people are not well versed in philosophical theory as most of you are. So it sort of insinuates that these ideas originate organically. But then I'll draw the parallel to the original organization of societies where you know the Neolithic you know, peoples had no concept of state time the government, of capitalism, and those still developed into hierarchical um, situations where in a lot of cases the caste you were born in would be the caste you would die in. So that's to say Perhaps anarchism and these sort of ideas originate organically in a ground level, but once you get sort of more involved, does it naturally tend to evolve into a sort of mandated structure, structured societies? And um, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Uh, I think I really have an answer to that, actually. Most of, most of the questions we're dealing with, I don't any of us have an answer to. The historical anthropologists, or at least one branch of them, claim that there's precisely seven spontaneous state societies in the history of the world. All other state societies occurred through contact with existing state societies. And the, part, the, the contrapositive of that argument is that these kinship societies that, that are the spontaneous, you know, in Marxian terms, the primitive communisms, right? Um, are stable. They're very stable. And that they don't automatically produce hierarchical class societies or state societies. And that um, that there's a lot of, there are a lot of, uh, what would you call it, social formations within these kinship societies capable and almost inevitably capable of resisting the obvious tendencies of people to try to get on top and so on and so forth. And so the answer would be, well, yeah, it, you know, it can happen, but it doesn't have to happen. So from that point of view, we've got to cover it, right? The trouble is that, you know, all of these, all of these, what we want to call them kinship societies, communal societies that, that begin to develop are surrounded by state societies that are capable of annihilating them. So it, they're not a solution unless they can somehow, uh, somebody, I've forgotten who said it here, you know, if you don't expand, you're going you're gonna to contract. So, you know, it, it, it ha there has to be a kind of mechanism for being aggressive that unfortunately I think is exactly where the problem is. Yeah, I would, I would actually just pose a real quick corrective to, to some of what you said about um, Katrina and what happened in the aftermath. Like, yeah, like we have to distinguish, right, between sort of the aesthetics of a sort of anti-authoritarian or anarchist politics and the content of that. And the content of that can emerge very organically and not be associated with, you know, explicit politicization or whatever. That can take any number of forms. The first Palestinian intifada was extraordinarily anarchist in, in many features, and, and Palestinians on the ground will tell you that. Uh, but they weren't identifying as anarchists in that uprising, right? In Katrina, there were actual anarchists on the ground doing the Common Ground Collective, some of whom took up arms against the elites who were going around and, like, shooting black folks who were, like, you know, getting too close to their communities. Uh, one of whom is a brilliantly articulate guy out of Austin named Scott Crow who did a book about this called Black Flags and Windmills about the Common Ground Collective. So there were actually people on the ground doing that and incidentally took up self-defense measures to protect what they were trying to create there, you know. So that does exist. Wow. Um, there's also people like David Graeber, James Scott, who are <coughs> anthropologists who document, you know, the ways in which uh, communities sort of uh, developed and, and, and evolved over time and I think Scott even documents ways in which communities have sought to resist becoming incorporated into states like communities that like phased out literacy so that they couldn't be subject to government documents and laws and, and things like that. 
not that I'm advocating phasing out literacy, but that there were actual strategies that um, <coughs> Aboriginal and Indigenous societies have, have undertaken to resist becoming sort of absorbed into or, or uh, colonized by state apparatus. What's the guy's name that wrote the uh, Common Ground? Uh, Scott Crow. Scott Crow, great. Right. And, and there's, and while we're on that subject, one version of the history of the Mayans, you know, who, it's a mystery. Why did the Mayan civilization disappear? One version of, the, of the, that history is, is that the people leave the state, and they took down the state government and they reestablished their kinship communities. Any more questions? Yeah. Do you want Do you want to call it with the next with the next question, or do you want to? I have like a thirty second response, which okay. is 30 seconds. 30, 30 seconds. There's, I I just would note that there's dangers in making political analysis based on yeah. anthropological history. Yeah. So, AKA, a, 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 even if we were never anarchists, we could still be anarchists. Yeah. And even if we were naturally anarchists, we don't have to be. Yeah. But you know, just. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. So this is a question that's sort of. Um, I guess in a way is echoing some of the concerns I think, Adam, you were drawing out as in your comments at the end of like, you know, the, the, the especially given the current moment we are situated in with the climate crisis that's literally impending. Um, because part of, so like a question I have for like someone like, like Richard, for instance, um, something that you raised, um, in terms of this idea of organizing on the global level without a central, you know, apparatus in place. Um, my concerns are twofold. The first being whether this doesn't actually, almost paradoxically and ironically, abet the sort of socialism in one country situation that actually was the birth of Stalinism, because there isn't, it seems to me, a global internationalist organizing apparatus that is making a revolution internationally, then I think you are left with some of the contradictions that gave rise to Stalinism and the, the you know, horrible consequences of that system that were, I think, born out of the fact that it was predicated on this idea that you could actually have socialism in one country within the capitalist global context. Um, the second thing is whether, so sorry, this is kind of long-winded, but the, 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 the second concern is, you know, in terms of, I, I, I certainly appreciate emphasizing the commonality in the ways in which anarchism and Marxism can absolutely learn from one another, and I think a lot of really great points have been brought out in this regard. But my, the, but my deep concern with the anarchist tradition um, is whether or not it is up to the task of actually meeting the challenge of climate change, of the fact that, you know, this, we're literally talking about the necessity of reorganizing gl globally. And it seems to me that given the, like, literal, like, you know, so to speak, not to be so dire, uh, but like ticking time bomb in a sense that we have set on us, uh, that that's necessitate, that the moment necessitates, you know, some sort of central organization on the global level. Um, so I was, you know, th this is for everybody, but I uh, was just drawing on your comments, I guess, in particular. Well, let me just sure. deal with that directly. Okay. Yeah. Uh, what I've tried to express is that a, a, glo a global, a planetary, uh, organized movement would not be centralized, would not be an apparatus, would not be, uh, would grow organically out of movements spreading via the internet and via all the media, that people see it's happening here, it's happening there, and a whole region goes up and then, and so on, and it's got to be like a, a, an idea virus that goes viral. And it would take the form of uh, uh, anti-corporate. It would take the form of international strikes, of global strikes against the big corporations that uh, exploit their workers, that oppress people, that take their land, that destroy uh, communities. And that these groups could connect up and organize from the bottom up uh, through the internet. This was the idea that Castoriadis invented uh, and he denied that it was uh, that he was a utopian, but to 18-year-old me, <laughs> it stuck in my mind that all of this is perfectly possible. And when 30 years later the web went up, I said it could happen tomorrow. The, the Thursday flash mob that saved the world.
Okay? And by the way, you do read Victor Serge's Memoirs of a Revolutionary. Victor Serge was a common turn employee during the 1919 to 1926. And you, uh, your, your facts are kind of a little bit mixed up. Stalin's idea that they couldn't have socialism in a single country was because they had failed to, the Russian Revolution and was objectively confined. And yet he was stuck with the slogan of communism. And so they called it that, but it was a new form of class society based on a tyrannical bureaucracy. But uh, the early attempts uh, to spread the revolution through the Communist International were well-intentioned, but it turned out to be somewhat catastrophic because Moscow, interfering in the revolutionary movements in Germany and other places, as often as not, got it wrong, okay? And so it resulted in the destruction of these movements and in their paralysis. <coughs> so the German communism, after Rosa Luxemburg and Liebknecht and others were killed in the first days, never developed a leadership or a structure because uh, they were reduced to being, depending on money and influence from Moscow. So it must be bottom up, it must be pluralistic, and uh, it's got to happen because there is no alternative. Incidentally, I think it's, it's, an, it's erroneous and, and even per, potentially reckless to think about the, the sort of engines driving ecological collapse or ecological catastrophe uh, being sort of evenly distributed across the globe. Um, I, I'm sure people saw those images that were being circulated around about Beijing and like the clouds of pollution and all that. And like the, the crucial sort of bit of info to have about that, I forget what the exact percentage was, but it was like the overwhelming majority of the production producing that pollution is exported to the United States. It's created by American demand, right? So it's not being created because of Chinese demand or Indian demand or whatever, that in fact, the engine driving that very dramatic scene that went viral was located primarily within the United States. So when we think about like, well, how do we deal with this globally? I mean, I, I think actually dealing with it tactically in a few major places would actually put a considerable dent in that, that inertia. Um, but, and I also think it's irresponsible and potentially we get into like racism and fascism by sort of evenly distributing culpability for I, I wasn't trying to suggest that by any means. No, 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 I, but I think we slip into that when we start to think like, oh, well, this is like a global sort of thing and requires a global response. And in fact, you know, it, it might just be a matter of taking down the big kids on the playground, you know. Yeah. There were two questions, Soren and Mike. Um, maybe Soren first because he had his hand up first. Can, can I just... Uh, oh, I just sure. want to thank everybody. I have to leave now, so sure. I just want to thank everybody, uh, the panelists and the audience. It's a very interesting, illuminating session. Uh, certainly great for me. I hope it's been as good for you all. Thank, thank you. you. I'll try to be as brief as possible. I have a, a very brief comment and then, and then a question. Uh, the comment just specifically uh, Joshua, I want, to, I want to take issue with your initial characterization of Marxism, mm -hmm. which you described as uh, you characterized as, as um, a tradition or a discipline, what have you, that takes exploitation as its primary object of analysis, critique, mm -hmm. whatever you want to call it. Uh, now, incidentally, the distinction between exploitation and domination, I, there certainly is a distinction to be made there. Uh, I don't know that uh, Marxism certainly not Marx himself, uh, took up one to the exclusion of the other. But the, the, the more central point that I wanted to make was that it's, it's perhaps a, a slight difference, but I think a major one. I'm not going to get into it, but at least just to flag it. Um, this primary object of analysis, critique, whatever you want to call it, was not exploitation as such. It was the specific historical form of exploitation and domination that takes place under capitalism. And that's a very different thing from, from taking up exploitation sure. as such, which has existed from, from the moment that societies were born. Uh, so I just wanted to say that. My question, um, there's been a lot of discussion about the different ways and different capacities that various forms of Marxism and various forms of anarchism can take up and respond to crises, whether they be economic, political, so on and so forth. Um, at one point, Adam, you, you uh, I think it was, it was almost an offhanded comment 
<laughs> mentioned uh, not only the response to these crises, but uh, the, the development of them. And so I wanted to sort of maybe push, push that question a little bit. In other words, if much of the discussion that we've been having, that I think, and I think this reflects the dis you know, discussions out there in general, have to do with the capacities of these various political ideologies, tendencies, what have you, to respond to and deal with crisis, what roles do they play, or what roles do they see themselves as playing in the development, or you know, the bringing to fruition of what we might call you know, the internal crises latent within the capitalist society? I might say something with regard to the last question. Um, what I, the, the section that I wanted to close with was the typology of three things you could do in the U.S. that aren't revolutionary but might help anyway, uh, which are um, the party left, the anarchist left, and the organizer left. Um, in, in other words, and I think each of them has limitations, but each of them generates uh, things that are objectively valuable. I think the party left uh, has, ma has a, the massive limitation of being microscopic compared to its ambitions uh, and being uh, uh, limited by, uh, you know, being the party left in the United States, what does that even mean? You know, you know, I mean, as recent struggles around should we have a security culture on the left have sort of dramatized, it's sort of absurd at this point to imagine as a party contesting for power at the U.S. nation state. But, on the other hand, as I was suggesting, I think they, because they've set out on that task, generated a lot of interesting theory and generated some valuable concepts about contesting with the state, about internationalism. And that, first of all, forging sort of communal links, but second of all, generating theory out of that conflict. So I think even if you're going to conclude the party left at the moment in the United States is aporetic or doesn't make sense or something like that, I think it generates some interesting thoughts. I think similarly about the anarchist left. I mean, one of my sort of... Uh, ongoing things with a bunch of my colleagues or comrades who are in uh, Occupy is I felt that very early on, if they had framed what they were doing as a massive work of political education, I think that they would have, it would have been popularly perceived as a massive success. Yep. Uh, yep. Whereas, if they, whereas unfortunately, a lot of voices ended up framing it as this is an insurrectionary struggle, and then it was doomed to be perceived as a yep. failure. And I think, uh, you know, so that would be another example, and that's, I'll let that serve as a metonym for the left. And then the organizing left, so unions, community organizing, and you know, uh, student organizing. I think they have the massive limitation that most of them structurally already limit themselves to not challenging the state. We're going to work within the state. But I think precisely because of that, they have some of the largest, broadest scale organizations. I mean, thousands and thousands of members large who are doing a bunch of work. This is my experience in unions. And they're definitely be constrained to not be particularly revolutionary because of the, the context in which they're working. But they generally they generate some of the most concrete stuff about this is how you know to build workers' communities, workers' collectives within the states. So I'd say this the United States is like among the most aporetic places to do left organizing. And so those are sort of I'd offer like three pre-crisis, you know, because obviously in a crisis things would be different. But your question is what to do in this sort of frozen moment pre-crisis. So that's three thoughts on that. Yeah, I completely agree with that Occupy. Like, I think that thinking about it in, in terms of strictly the construction of what happened in the squares or this insurrection or anything, was, it was completely missing the forest for the trees. Um, I don't necessarily know that I have much of an answer to your question um, about sort of accelerating crisis, right? or accelerating forms of disjuncture that would bring about a typical social movement. Part of that is because um, I think that one of the major limitations, and this is, I think, and to be clear, 